If I have to do this again, I promise you, y'all, it ain't meant for me to do. Anyway, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome to the mental house with me, your host, Khadija. Um, I want to read an article, and it was written by Michelle Dickinson Morovic, and it's talking. It's it's t- entitled "Growing Up with a Parent Experiencing a Mental Disorder." So, whatever side of the diaspora that you're on, welcome, welcome, welcome to the mental house. And I hope this information can resonate someplace in your heart. Okay? Check it out. When you love someone with a bipolar disorder, life can be very freaking unpredictable. In my case, it was my mother who struggled with this illness. She was in and out of the hospital half a dozen times throughout my childhood. She was often so depressed that she couldn't get out of bed and would cry uncontrollably for hours. Other times, she'd have what I now know were manic episodes, which were kind of dangerous. Um, they, they They were like taking a trip to Disney World. She would crank up the music and start singing and dancing. Then suddenly she'd be running around the house naked. I refer to these ups and downs as the roller coaster. She could also be emotionally and physically abusive, slapping me and my brother and sister, telling us that we were garbage and imposing all types of arbitrary rules on us. There were times when I had to stay home from school because my father had to work, and she was too fragile to be home by herself. And when I was in school, instead of paying attention to my teachers, I spent all day worried about how my mom was doing. Plus, I was weighed down with a secret that I had a crazy mother. It wasn't until I was in high school that I understood that my mother had a mental illness. Still, it was tough for me to be sympathetic. Instead, I felt angry. So, as soon as I was old enough, I began to get jobs in restaurants to have an excuse to spend time away from home. I also figured that if I was going to be working so hard, I might as well get paid for it and receive some appreciation. Taking care of my mother and constantly strategizing with my pop about getting a new doctor or what new medication, it seemed like a thankless job in comparison. When I was 18, I moved out of the house and went to live with my boyfriend. Then at 23, I got married early to another guy who turned out to be a male version of my mother. It's usually what we do. We usually pick someone that is reflecting one of our parents or both in some capacity because it's like we're looking for again like the therapist says they always say you're looking for a corrective outcome and maybe in psychologically in some kind of way if I can have this and ride off into the sunset with this level it'll fix the hurt and pain that um, was inflicted on me in childhood it's, it's really something how that works it really is um, he didn't have bipolar, at least not diagnosed, but he was routinely depressed and abusive, and I found myself constantly trying to fix him, just like I tried to fix my mother. It wasn't until my mid-twenties when I divorced him and started going to therapy that I began to heal and learn that it was okay to put some distance between me and my mother, even though I loved her. And then, one day at work, I got a call from my father that my mother had died suddenly of a heart attack. It was only when she was gone, following a lot of self-exploration, that I was able to start having real compassion for what life with a mental illness must have been like for her. My journey to reclaim myself. I put myself through college and graduate school while working in the pharmaceutical industry. Over that time, I realized that I could and I should tell my story. So in 2013, I submitted a proposal to an internal program that encourages employees to speak on various topics of their choice in a TED talk style format. I wanted mine and my experience growing up uh, with a bipolar mother. I let myself get raw and vulnerable on stage. And afterward, 
colleagues came up to me and said, wow, you really exposed yourself. And I, I knew that. But by being me, I was creating a safe space for others to talk about their own issues around mental health. Especially when you start talking about your childhood. And forget about all the outside extenuating circumstances like race and all that. So, I don't know, we're not going to go that far yet. We just start right there in what happened in your house. See? Because it's real easy to latch on the other, other stuff outside that and not stay right here. Because once you stay right here, all that other stuff is going to resolve itself. In my opinion, my humble opinion. The world, it doesn't matter if you're dealing with a social path that is in your family or a social path or bipolar, whatever, in the White House. It's the mental illness, it's the, the anti-empathy gene that is run through the country that has created these behaviors in these people. Anyway, she says, I knew but by being me, I was creating a safe space again for others to talk about their own mental health issues. The feedback I got was so positive, I thought that if I can do this, then I can write a bit book. Excuse me. So I spent four years working on my memoir, breaking into my life, growing up with a bipolar parent, and my battle to reclaim myself. The goal was not just to tell the story of my childhood, but to help people understand what it was like to love somebody with a mental illness. There has been too much silence around this issue, too much hush-hush and too much stigma. I want to cause conversations to happen so people realize that having a mental illness is just like having heart disease or any other health condition. It's not anything to be ashamed of. The more we talk about it, the more people will get the help that they need for loved ones or for themselves. And tools like the app 18% that facilitate immediate peer-to-peer -peer support can make all the difference for those who are struggling. The difference in openness around mental illness today compared to when I was growing up is incredible. A short time ago, a peer reached out and said, you know, I'm 61, I'm bipolar, and I never understood the impact that my disease might be having on others. I bought five copies of your book, one for everybody in my family. Thank you very much. Reactions like that are why I want to tell the world about my experience. The fact that my little story could change someone's perspective on mental illness, that's huge. So I want to thank um, Michelle Dickinson for that article, uh, I want to also, uh, I don't have a t-shirt hanging up, but I also want to encourage you again to support our mental health uh, mission, um, and for me, it becomes real, um, when those of us, for those of y'all who don't know, um, we run a non-profit, and we were, I told you before, we used to do a group home, um, but we've changed our mission statement because of the Trump that is going on in our community, because of the mental health issue, I've decided to kind of, you know, membership partner up with NAMI because I really want to uh, bring a safe space where people can talk about, in our community, can talk about being involved and what mental health means to them. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a mental disorder. Okay, let's get this straight. It can be high conflict. It can be a personality disorder. Okay? And so, we, but we have to take the stigma away from it. And I think in, a, in my community and most black communities all throughout the country, our kids are experiencing too much trauma. And if anything I can do before I leave here to help um, set up a safe space where these children can talk about their witnessing and talk about the violence that they experience and what it makes them feel like and to get in touch with their feelings as opposed to just putting them on some psychotropic drugs, 
um, you know, Depakote and all that, Ritalin and all. Before we do all of that, let's really get a grip on my community and the trauma that these children are, are and and that's something that we got to do. And I don't know if nobody loves us enough to help us, but we're going to find out. So that's what my contribution is working through NAMI. A lot of y'all um, want to know why am I big? Why am I up in that organization? I just, uh, I'm up in any organization that's dealing with the madness that's going on on the planet. That's all. And it's just that I've worked with NAMI for a long time. I told you they were very instrumental in getting the Johnny Carson stalker back home. And that was a black man. And they used all the resources that they could give us. And they advocated for us. And that was one person, yeah. But he was stuck in Patton, California, in a mental house, in a, in a state prison, mental prison, when he was suffering from a mental disorder. And it was NAMI. The National Alliance on Mental Illness that helped return him back to his community and environment and got him the help that he needed as opposed to wasting away in a prison. So I want y'all to know that because um, I did get that question. Um, why am I being up NAMI? So with that being said, y'all, I'm going to get off of here. I, I, if you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, and share. And don't be afraid or ashamed to support us to support yourself, to even find support in your community or start some support in your community. And let's talk about some of this experience, the, the, the trauma that these kids are experiencing and how that's going to affect, and it is affecting their mental health. Okay? So with that being said, if you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you next time in the Mental House. Bye-bye.